Okay, so uh, thank you all for, for joining tonight. Obviously, we can see that uh, there's quite a large number of us. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the saw has drawn uh, a lot of uh, attention to us all. Um, so tonight, we're, we're very lucky to have um, Jack and Shane Skelton talking about uh, the last 250 years of, of uh, English hand saws. Um, but, but before we go there, let's just talk about a little bit about Bench Talk 101. Um, you know, this was set up um, because of COVID, because we were all distancing, we were so socially isolating, and therefore we were getting a bit of withdrawal symptoms, and we wanted to get together so that we could, you know, talk uh, woodwork and, and just enjoy the stuff that's going on. Um, and th this is kind of getting bigger and bigger every week. Um, you, you know, in the last couple of weeks, and including today, we've got people from America, Canada, Australia, Brazil, Austria, Sweden, Spain, and, and of course, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, this will be as, as, big as, as big as we want to make it. Um, and remember, we're, we're doing this as, as amateurs, so don't shoot me when it all goes wrong. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're trying our best here. Um, a big thank you, really. The last three talks, we had uh, Bill Carter, we had um, uh, uh, Jim um, Hendricks, and we had Richard Arnold. And they were all talking about um, their um, uh, products that they made and they gave away in a charity. And I just wanted a, a big shout out, really, because um, for, the, for the Macmillan nurses, um, that charity um, draw actually raised £5,836. So it's, it's really, really good. So brilliant work guys brilliant work um so at this time of the year we would have been going to lots of different shows and kind of at the shows it's it's one of our favorite times to get together we look at the tools we look at the you know the, the products that are being made um and, and we sort of you know stand back and we we observe it and we we we, we can talk forever on it um and obviously at the moment we don't have that opportunity I think for me, one of the things I do like doing at the shows is, is seeing the new tools and, and the new equipment that's coming out and the new practices. And, and I think, um, you know, when, when you're missing that at the moment, how can we bring that here? Well, if we look at uh, the, the guest speakers tonight, we've got Jack and Shane. Um, it is an absolute pleasure every time you go to one of the shows to actually just hold one of his new saws. Um, they're absolutely items made to perfection um you, you would look at them and you think you know how on earth would you use this you'd be afraid to scratch it um but they are absolute masterpieces um and so tonight i'm going to stop i'm going to um let shane and, and jack talk about what they've done um talk about the history of the saws and, and kind of what they do to, to make it different so i'm going to suggest that you all stay on mute um i'm going to unmute um uh shane and I'm going to put you on the speaker view. If you all go on to speaker view, what you then get is, is uh, uh, Shane and, and Jack at their best, you know, right up on the screen. So uh, that should have unmuted you now. And I'm putting you on to that view. We've got Martin on there. So I'd admit Martin, but Martin um, is currently on there. So Shane, if you, um, if, you, if you say something now, you should be unmuted. Yeah. Brilliant. There you Hi, are. Everyone. Can you hear us? Yeah, we all can hear you. If you fire away. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, well, actually, I'm not going to say much tonight. Shane's going to talk. He's going to talk about um, the history of saws and about our tools. And if you want to come in at the end and ask me any questions, then that's fine. Ask anything you like. Um, I'm going to stand at the side and let Shane do his bit um, and rein him in when he starts going on a little bit too much, which he does now and again. So um, take it away, Shane. Yeah. Yeah, so we're just going to cover how SARS came about, you know, in this country, how they developed, and then what we've done to carry that tradition on, uh, which is a dying craft, really. So, so where it all began, really, SARS almost looked like swords with a barbed edge. In the, the start of the 18th century, a clever man came along called White. Now, the White family, turned saws into what we know today. They were the people that put an actual back onto a saw to make a saw rigid, put a closed handle onto the saw, developed the pistol grip handle on the saw. And it's really thanks to whites that saws look like they look now. Now the white family 
had lots of children and those children went on to form all the major saw makers that were around at that time for the next really 80 to 100 years all came from the white family now we are very similar to the white family in the fact that the whites were a husband and wife team and when uh, when mr white died his wife actually took over the family business and ran it with their children and their daughters went on to make saws so makers like squire peters um gatwood mormon man Mormon, all of those had influences from the white family so moving on from white which were they were based in london the first actual saw maker to come out of london was kenyon now kenyon saws again what he did was they were they made saw files edge tools they went into making saws as a bit of a sideline but what they actually did was poach the london saw makers to show them what how to do it really um, so the saws that you see which are the most recognized 18th century saws are the saws that are found in the tool chest of benjamin seaton which i'm sure everyone knows about it's you know there's even a a book on it which you can get from taft society and it talks about it's the it's basically the best preserved 18th century collection of hand tools um, some are unusable, just overaged, they've never been out and the planes are warped and twisted, but the saws are exceptional. Now, the saws that are in there, people look at and they look at how fancy they are, and really, they're just an insight into the saws that were being made in that time. You can't take too much from saying, oh, they're the saws that were available, they're what people use it those saws were sold through christopher glick gabriel who you know was famous for selling planes he was a, a london tool provider for the profession that was out there now what he actually supplied was just in the middle line of a tw 26 inch you know panel saws a sash saw a dovetail saw and a carcass saw now all those saws were just mid-size so it's just like someone saying I want a smooth uh, a jack and a jointer. They didn't really give you a massive insight in the sizes that were available, also different styles and different woods. You'll notice as well that those saws, whilst they were made in Sheffield, were stamped London. Now, that London name is just the same as it is today. If it's got London stamps on it, it has that higher value that's connected to the tool it's more sought after than if it's just stamped sheffield so it's going back like i say if if it hadn't been for the whites turning a saw into how we look at a saw today which hasn't really changed apart from the modern plastic saws nothing's really happened in the in the saw world um, after the 18th century so just at the time when those saws were made for Benjamin Seaton, saws were suddenly mass produced. So the, the saw handles, the backs, the blades were all made piecework. So they were, they were all commissioned to the different saw manufacturers that were springing up all over in Sheffield. You know, what started off was one, you know, they grew into someone else, into someone else. People moved around, people set up on their own. So, so they were all buying the same parts from the same people. So, you'll, so the only way to distinguish the saws that were made really was the medallion and the stamp. The actual handle designs were to the piece worker that was making those handles, whoever they were using. But before that time, saws had a finesse of you could tell that saw which saw shop that came from. Now, that saw shop would only have one to two people working in it. They were also getting the feedback from the cabinet makers at the time. 
you know, like Chippendale, you know, Hepplewhite, all of the all of the best makers that were making furniture would not have just gone into a saw shop and took took you know something back and said, oh yeah, it'll do. You'll have to live with it. They'll have said, you know, I want it like this. I want it this length. I want the blade this thin. I'm cutting, you know, this type of timber. So you've got to remember that at this time there was such a massive change on what timbers were, were used. At the start of the 18th century, nearly everything was just oak. You know, there, there was not much variety. Then all of a sudden you had the ships coming in with the ballast weight from trees from all other countries, of which, you know, the, the top furniture makers buy these trees, turn them into furniture, and that's why you get all of these different types of timber that are used in furniture that you saw in the 18th century. So people like Chippendale, and were, they were buying off the docks. This became a massive wood trade, you know, of all these exotic woods from, you know, all over from, you know, so, so the saws had to cope using the different timbers, which would mean, you know, different teeth configurations, rake angles, you know, different crosscut configurations, you know, so, so the, the amount of saws that suddenly sprung up at that time is much more than what happened before that time. So what we do as a business is we've looked at when saws were made at the best. So we are, we, we're not really interested in Victorian saws, which like I say, well, like I've explained, are all just, you know, they're all much of a muchness. You can put them all together and there's not really much between them and performance wise they're a bit numb they're they're made to fit everyone you know they're quite heavy hefty things um and they have the problems but if you go back to earlier saws the finesse and the balance and how they feel in the hand and how easy they cut um it just represents that era of time when you look at you know, the, the houses that were made, the furniture that was made, you know, everything just had more, you know, it had more finesse, more grace to it than what we saw in the Victorian times. It's in the Victorian times, we basically trying to copy everything that the Jordans had done, but quicker and cutting corners. So that's the period we've, you know, we've chosen to make saws from. And we follow the same ethos of, someone saying well I, I want to saw sort of this sort of size this is the scale of work that i'm doing um we take someone's hand measurement that person chooses what timber they want to use from the selection of what we've got and then we custom make a saw that fits that process of what they're doing and um, so that is why we make now you know so many different saws. we make over 30 different saw combinations in different styles which is far more than any other saw maker now makes but we are only a husband and wife team doing it so we, we can only produce um around you know eight saws a month whereas you know our next nearest manufacturer in england you know can can make 1500 a month so we were we're in a completely different area and when we first started with the business is we we quickly found that there was no way we could compete making production style saws you know of the likes of you know the you know the, the makers that are out there which are off the shelf because it's just not viable it's not actually making a saw it is like i was explaining before you just buying parts in assembling them and sending them out every saw that we make is is personally made it's made by my hands. Every single item on the saw is made in-house. There's nothing bought in. Um, so you, you're actually getting something custom made as the same as if you had a suit made at Savile Row, it's the same thing. Or if you had a, you know, anything that's got that level of detail in it is something that you can't get with something that's mass produced. Um, so what, what we've done, which, um other saw makers have probably chosen not to do is to actually look at the design of a saw 
and think, what are the problems? What, what do we see as the problems? You know, I saw that's 250 years old. What's, what's gone wrong with it? Um, now, like I said, the earlier saws, you know, if I look at a, a saw like this, this is a, a very early Kenyan saw. You can see it's stamped very firmly Kenyan on that side. Now, you know, it's had a hard time. It's been probably through several, you know, different cabinet makers, but you can see how well it's been looked after and the fact that the blades, you know, have started out life down here and it's just been sharpened and sharpened and sharpened because it's, it's been someone's best saw going through the different times. So, so something like that, you can see it still works. It's still tight. You know, the, the braid's still rigid. It's still fairly straight. You know, for a saw this age, you know, we're over 200 years old with this saw. Now, when you look at the modern saws, they don't survive like this. They, they, they tend to be quite rubbish. And also the steel that's, that's in them, the, the actual blade, a lot of people think, oh, if I buy a, a saw that's, you know, 60 years old, 100 years old, it's going to have a really good blade. It's going to, you know, last my time out. But what people don't realise is the actual steel that's used, they use so many different qualities of steel, ranging from cast steel, German steel, spring steel, and, and they were different purities depending which saw manufacturer they came from. And you've got to remember that each saw manufacturer was competing, one with the overall appearance of the saw, saying theirs is best over someone else's, but also on price and profit. So it, when you go to 100 years ago, the saws were actually pretty poor. They were, they were, they, we had all these makes all competing but using the worst materials imaginable just because they could charge, you know, make more profit, make more saws, make more money. So this, this conception of thinking, oh, I've got this old saw, I've got this old Tizak, I've got this, thinking you've got the world, really you haven't because what happens, the, the steel over time actually it ages itself. It, it's it's not a case of it being, you know, moved or manipulated and it work hardening. It's carbon steels actually inherently get brittler and brittler and brittler over time. So it's not like buying a really good plain iron, like Bill was explaining, you know, last week where the old plain irons were brilliant. They were. The, the steel was unbelievable. They hold an edge brilliantly. But with saws, the steel actually gets harder and harder and harder as time goes on. Not through rusting, it just through aging. And this is why you can end up with old saws that when you come to set the teeth, you can hear the teeth snapping. Now, they weren't snapping when they set them originally, but just over time, the, the steel's got more brittle. And also, the steel starts to lose the ring, so you get a, a dead sound. To the, uh, to the steel itself. So what we've done is we've used, you know, we use the best materials you can for the blade. So the blade materials, um, we've limited it down to two mills, which we get our steel from. Um, and we buy the best purest grade that there is, which is too expensive for the production saw makers to use. Um, but we want to use the best materials that are available. The, the other thing that we do is, like I was saying earlier, is we look at the design of one, how, how, how it all works, the geometry of a saw. So if you look at a saw like this, this is one of our London long stroke saws, 13 and 3 quarters. Now, what's important is this hang angle in relation to the blade and how high your hand sits to the back and how deep the plate is. Now when you pick a saw up that fits perfectly, it should fit with your finger actually pointing to the centre of the blade. We're not trying to force our finger on the top, that's not where you should hold a saw, you should hold it like that. So 
when you push this saw forward and there's the friction of the saw plate cutting, that automatically provides the correct amount of downward pressure without you applying any downward pressure. So if the saw's all balanced right, you don't need a great big thick inch back. You can see this is three quarters tapered down. Now, it's a very light nimble saw, but it's, it's a saw that when people pick up at the shows and they use, they can't believe how easy it glides. And that's just down to making everything right. Now, modern makers will use the same handle design on any length saw, whether it's a carcass saw, dovetail saw, the geometry is the same. So to get round it, everything gets bigger and chunkier, and you just you can end up fighting the saw to make it work um, and what we've done is you know make everything easy to work the other thing that we've done moving on from this this is an 18th century georgian saw from around 1760 an exact you know copy of that saw now saw design has never changed from the blade the back and how that is all the marriage in the handle so the the cheek of the handle is clamping onto the brass and then clamping onto the blade so this alignment is key to get everything perfectly straight you know so the saws you know the blades completely level you haven't got where the blade comes off and then comes off at a different angle so this is this is hard to do and also over time which is why we use quarter sawn timber is if this wood moves it will affect the alignment now it's very slight but it will affect it so we go to great lengths to make sure you can see how that back fits in this fits in on a haunch joint so there's no movement the bolts that go through actually go through the blade the blades you know reamed out to accept the bolts now what modern manufacturers do is the handles made and drilled, the blades made and drilled, but the blades made with bigger holes because you've got a tolerance between the two parts going together. So they put more bolts through when everything's tightened down, but eventually that comes loose. These remain tight with just the bolt going through with no saw nut, nothing will move, you know, that because we're trying to get the most precision we can out of the tool but you've still got this touch on of wood on blade. So what we've done, looking at this design and to change things, which hasn't, like I say, hasn't been changed for over 250 years, is we've got designs like this. So this is the Chippendale saw that we make. You can see that, stamped with Chippendale's signature, fluted back. Now you can see on this saw, if you look underneath, this is made of bronze, but this back is actually all one piece going all the way around the front there. So there's no influence of that woodwork. The handle isn't actually doing any alignment whatsoever. The back is the full alignment. The other thing is inside here, there's actually a, a leaf spring, which I'll show you. So this is, this is a back before it's shaped. So you can see there the groove where the blade fits in. And you can see here, you've got this spring which is machined in. Now this is made of spring bronze. You can see there's, that's threaded for a screw at the back. This spring is compressed. The blade's assembled in. It's then pinned through the front. And then it's pinned through the bottom part of this spring. And then this screw is then released, which leaves the blade under constant tension along its length, as well as pulling the tooth line. Now that, that, that's different from conventional saw tension, which is where you're just relying on a friction fit on the back, kicking up once it's assembled, pulling the tooth line. Now, if you put the tooth line in tension, you actually put the upper part of the blade in compression. This 
actually does both. So it pulls the tooth line as well as pulling the blade. So it works very much like if you're running your bands are loose and then tying it up as you're putting wood through it, you'll see it cuts and it sings much better with a tighter blade than it does with a slack blade. So that's what this does. Now the mallard saw, which is this one, this uses the same idea. This is side plated. And it's shaped, the reason we call it the mallard is it's shaped like the front end of the mallard train. Now this is a carbon steel one that, you know, it's exactly the same. You can see it's shaped there. And then you can see at the back here, there's this slide. And again, the blade is assembled in and it's pinned at the front. It's pinned when the slides close and then there's a screw in the back, which then pulls this and pulls the blade in tension. Now, the blade itself is actually cut round in this shape and it misses these bolt holes. So there's no interference between these bolts and the blade. So like I say, the handle isn't actually doing anything. So they're, they're things that we've done to look at the problems that you have with a saw and to actually just take a step back because all of the makers there's been, you know, in the last 250 years have basically copied what the maker did before. So if we look at the most famous maker that I get sick of hearing every time we go to a show, I've got some distance saws and I'm like, oh, well done. <laughs> you know, now what Diston did was he became the richest American of his day. So he was the richest man in America making saws. Now, that doesn't mean his saws are the best saws. It means he was the best at marketing what he did. So this is an English saw with three bolts in. This is my saw with six bolts in. This is a traditional back saw. This is a skew back saw. It's better because I don't have to put the nib on and I've cut some time out. I don't have to shape a tongue on a handle because I've now put flat sides on it. So all he's done is speed up the manufacturing process. And, you know, this then came from England. He learned his trade in England and went over to America to make his money. So he's... His saws really were very much pile them high, sell them cheap. Um, so the, there's also two different types of distance. You've got the distance, the Philadelphia ones. You've got the cheaper ones. But you've got to remember, he didn't put his hand to them. He hired thousands of people making his saws, all with their own level of perfection, you know, at the end of it, putting it together which isn't what the English makers were doing at the time, where you had a handful of people. And this is why English saw makers couldn't compete with what he was doing in the States. And it became cheaper to import a distance saw from America than it did to have a saw made in England, which really doesn't make any sense. But like I say, he was just a very, very clever businessman. So it's just to show you as well that we do this is the inside of a um, gentleman jack saw which is named after jack my wife and the popular tv program that was on as well so you can see what we've done again we've got a back this fastens into the handle this is screwed on underneath but again you've got no this is one that's just going through at the minute you have no um, interference on the blade. So the blade effectively, the woodwork is not doing anything to interfere with the, with the blade and the blade's tension within the back. Now the tensioning that we do is not like what anyone else does. So a lot of people say, well, how come your source feels so tight and they're so stretched and you can't, you can't really move the blade about? And that's due to a process that we use that we developed 
which ensures that the blade remains constantly tight and pulled when it's assembled. Now, a folded back, um, which is really where it all began, taking a piece of brass and bending it, the reason I tend not to use traditional folded backs is one, they're very agricultural, they're, they're, they're very poor on how they actually grip the blade. You know, we're working with, some, with a, a metal that has to be softer than the steels that I use and the brass that I use or the bronze that I use because the grade of brass you need to use to actually bend is a much softer grade than the grade that I use with a machine. So uh, the other thing is you're relying on two bent surfaces to come together in a line and to put a blade perfectly straight. And this, this then creates lots of straightening issues and how the blade fits. Also the blade can move like this as it's only clamped on the very tip. It's not clamped over its length. So we make, you know, a variety of different backs. But if we, if we look at this one, this is another uh, back that we use in the Kenyan seats and saws that we make. So we've, we've copied those saws exactly one to one, but what we've done is put another element of what we make inside it rather than just being a direct copy, we've, we've wanted to improve upon it. So this is what we call the millfold back, which you can see here, it's got a lug on. You can see how that slit all the way along. Now, this, this is squashed, which grips the blade just the same as a folded back does, but the blade is pinned at the front. It's then pulled as it's knocked into the back. So the blade's actually made slightly curved as it goes into the back. So this back is trying to pull back straight, pulling on the two fly. And the front bolt that goes through to assemble the saw actually passes through this lug, through the blade and through the woodwork, which means that the, the blade can't shake itself loose because it's pinned, which is one of the problems you get with buckling on a folded back is when the blade you know, just comes loose and then you end up with a concertina in it. Um, so, so this is actually pushed by the handle rather than just drilling through the blade and pushing the handle, which in effect is compressing the blade. So you're actually pushing on the back of how that saw works. So it's just little things like that, that we've done to improve things. But then when you use a tool and you hear that ring to it is, this is a question we always get asked in saws is, at shows is, you know, how come it cuts so well? You know, I've, I've tried everything. I've picked that up. I've never used a saw like that before. And it's, it's all these little things and going back in time that influences what we make in the fact of how custom it is, but also how we've, you know, we've made something that's going to then survive and last the test of time like the early saws have done. Uh, even if people don't appreciate tools, when they keep clearing out a garage and they look at, you know, good saws and good planes, they'll know, oh, actually, I'd, I won't put this in the skip, we'll put this into the sale room. And that's the difference between, you know, what we're trying to do. We're trying to have something for the future as, as well as, you know, providing things for tools for cabinet makers of today. Uh, other designs that we've got, this is fairly new. Um, this is a dual curve starter. So you can see this is a back with two slots in there. Um, this is so that for when people are marking out dovetails, this idea came from David Barron. Um, of, of having two parallel blades mounted, you know, what alongside each other, and this is just an example of some of the things that we do. In the fact that we're not saying we know everything for every tool that's out there, we take feedback from people and cabinet makers and saying, you know, if I could have something like this or something to do this job, we'll be spokely make something to do that. Um, you know, that as long as we know it's going to be viable and it's it's going to work. And other saws that we've done, which I gave you a glimpse of um, last week, this is the archer saw that we're making. 
um, which has a tapered octagonal handle and also you can see this detail in the back of the blade and if you look very fine I don't know if you can pick that up it says um, S skeleton in here it's stamped London and then for it to be an archer and we've taken the cupid bow what we've done on the back is have the back shaped like an arrow coming back into the handle if you can see that detail there and it's just little things just to make something you know have more finesse than just you know just a tool you know or copying what someone else does so it's you know we, we are we try to be native you know with the designs that we make you can also see how that's fluted now the other thing that we do as well which jack's quiet over here <laughs> but basically when we design in a saw like this so this is the chippendale saw that we make um jack will say to me you know like this saw it's chippendale 300 um we need to make a chippendale saw to celebrate chippendale's life you know 300 years ago when he was born so that's my brief to, to design a saw too so you know this saw handle design comes from the exact period of when chippendale um basically his um he'd, he'd gone to london He'd come out with a director, he was starting to get commissions, he had so many different competitors making furniture, he was starting to take over. And mysteriously, his workshop burnt down, which destroyed, you know, over 20, 23 tool chests, with which he could not, um, you know, replace the tools, he didn't have that kind of money. So he went out and crowdfunded to buy tools for his workers um, and going to the gentry. So this saw design came from a saw maker just round the corner from where Chippendale was, who at that time had a small shop. And within the next year, he'd moved into bigger premises on a brand new build in London making saws. So that's that's not too coincidental that that had happened. So this design's taken from that maker. The overall length of the saw is determined because we went to Harewood House. We looked at Chippendale's furniture, which is the most extensive collection there is in the world. We looked at the Diana and Minerva commode. We opened it up, um, you know, privately with the collections team, and I examined all the dovetails in that piece of furniture and what I found in it was the what he'd done is concealed the dovetails um, so you, you know they were exposed like you know we we like to say exposed dovetails he concealed them so that you couldn't see the joints but on one particular side drawer they were exposed and on that exposed dovetail there was an overshoot on one of the lines and that overshoot gave me the the curve fit width of what they'd use to cut those dovetails so this saw um, exactly matches that curve width it also takes into account the width of the draw sides ganged up of how long the saw would be um, and that's how this saw comes about making it of bronze Chippendale didn't use brass for all his fittings he preferred bronze so this saw's made of bronze the other thing that Chippendale did was introduce fluting into the chair legs, stop fluting, which made things look slimmer. So I've carried that on and put fluting. You can see this is all fluted as opposed to chamfered, um, which is quite hard to do, but it just gives a, an overall graceful appearance. So again, it's, it's not just making a tool. There's a history behind how we make that tool you know and what we what we're trying to have that as you know going on in the future of people looking back on the other thing that we do with our saws is every saw we make is numbered and we keep a register of the people that buy our saws again for future history so underneath the um the, the handle here on the back is stamped in code 
the type of the saw that it is and what number it is. Um, and this is this this is good for us in the fact as we know you know who's receiving the tools, but also we have some collectors that buy our tools that want to keep their number. You know, that, oh, I have all this number. Next time you bring one of those out, I'll have one in that number. Um, but really, it's mainly done as a record, just so we can record, you know, all the saws that we make and where we go. Now, the other thing is people look at them and think, you know, which was said earlier, is crikey, I don't use it. These tools are built to be used. They are, they cut to the line, they're, they're you know, they're all honed, they're tuned, finely tuned. You don't need to, you know, go in with a chisel after you've cut. Everything's joint ready off the saw. So mainly our saws go to professional cabinet makers that want to save time. They want, they've, they've thought for years that with tools that don't cut and have to use machinery, but really a good cutting saw cuts out the machinery, especially you've got a setup time. If you've got a tool to hand that you can just use, you cut out another three machine tools to do one tool's job. So we have cabinet makers that say it's actually saved me time getting one of your saws than it has, you know, having my band saw set up, my table saw set up, you know, you, everything's set up and, and then the minute you want, then want to use those tools, you've got to disturb the setup. So that's where our saws come in really. So I want to stop it there. So I've been going on. Oh, in the... oh yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> Jack's just reminded me. Other products that we we now make, uh, and, and this, so this is our skeleton source peacock oil, which we use on all our handles. Um, this was developed, I, I've basically done it I, through a previous career, you know, as a gunsmith. Um, it's, it's a very similar finish to what goes on English gun stocks. You can see there, that's bare wood, that's it with the oil on. Um, we use this on all our handles because the oil actually penetrates into the wood. It, it doesn't it doesn't work like a surface finish, it makes the wood harder, it seals it off from moisture and you know expansion, compression with different humidities, but it still allows the wood to breathe. Um, so it was it was done as this is what I use on the saws, but then speaking to people at the shows going gosh, what do you put on your saw handles to make them look so good? Well, we just, we make our own stuff. We should be selling that. And so that, that's where that came about. And, and one last thing, uh, like I said, before we open it up to questions, cutting teeth on blades is done one by one on a fly press. So one tooth at a time, we don't use any machinery. It's exactly the way, same way it was done 250 years ago. The other thing that I achieve with doing it this way is just the accuracy. So you can see there's two, two saw blades there, both cut one by one on a fly press. But if I put these two together, you can see how they're absolutely perfect each tooth falls into the tooth. There's no difference over that whole length. So that's, you know, 14 inches long. And you can see how it's not, you know, even fractionally out, otherwise the two plates won't go together. So it's just to demonstrate the accuracy you can get just doing one at a time. And again, you know, after that point, they're all hand filed and set. So I'll leave it at that and then open it up, you know, to questions. Wow, <laughs> Shane. I mean, absolutely. Your your attention to detail is absolutely amazing. Your engineering skills to improve the the saw that's been around for two hundred and fifty years. It's just it's just incredible, incredible. Right. Questions. So what we're going to do? We're going to do the same as last week. Um, what we've got in the bottom. If you hover your mouse down into the bottom of the uh, screen, you'll see a chat button. So what we'll do is, if you just write your name in the chat button, then I'll come to you and I'll say, you know, uh, you can then unmute your microphone and then ask the question. So uh, any questions from anybody? You give it a time. I know that I know that Bill Bill Carter's gone. Chester, off we go, Chester. Hey, am I unmuted? Yeah. Okay, that was a great presentation. Uh, the history was amazing, 
um, the, the way you related the saws to history and the time periods was phenomenal. Um, the, the questions I have are, um, uh, you talked about how the handles changed and, and the, the methodology changed over the years, but uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit to the sharpening, setting, and raking of the teeth and, um, and, and if you ever decided or ever thought about modifying that and going with something new or, or that you do it customarily because you believe that that's to be the best and you haven't found anything better. And then the second thing was you talked about um, the handle, the Chippendale handle being period to Chippendale, the style and the design. But early in the speech, you mentioned that you measure somebody's hand and, and their size and what they're working on and you adjust your saws to the individual. So I'm wondering when you have a Chippendale style handle, how do you adjust that to the individual or do you not? Those right, no, that's fine. Well, with the, with the actual shaping of the teeth, so the, the gullets of your tooth, the tooth configuration, you're using a 60 degree triangular file, which you can, you know, which is called a free square file. So your, your gullet's always gonna be at 60 degrees. Now what you can do with that is adjust the rake angle. So if, say it's a rip saw and the teeth are filed directly across, they're at 90 degrees. So that rake angle, the more aggressive the rake angle is, so the more that angle comes up to the vertical. So when people say, oh, it's six degrees rake, it's six degrees relaxed back from vertical and that's what your rake angle is. So the, it, the rake angle is determined by how aggressive you want the saw to be, what type of timber you're cutting in, and how many teeth you've got on the saw. So if you've got a, you know, a big panel saw, and you're taking aggressive cuts, and you've got deep teeth, so that the teeth are more spaced around, so we can say we're talking, talking five teeth per inch, that rake angle can be more aggressive. So you've, you've got a big area of where the dust can fall out of, and you're taking a very much aggressive cut into the timber. So you've got the timber at this top edge, taking almost a, you know, a vertical cut. Now that saw is hard to start because you're, you're, all, you're, you're effectively hitting a flat edge into the wood. The more relaxed that rake angle becomes, the more it's wanting to glide over the wood as it starts. So that makes the saw feel smoother. Now what you can do is if you have a very fine saw, so it's, say it's 20 teeth per inch, you can get away with a more aggressive rake angle because you've got much more teeth bridging the width of the piece of wood that you're cutting. Now, the amount of teeth that you need is governed by how wide the piece of timber is that you're cutting. That's why there's so many different saw lengths and teeth configurations. So if you, if you go on a rule of, so you, you roughly need six full teeth bridging the piece of wood that you're cutting to select the saw size. So if you're cutting, you know, something that's quarter or you're using a panel saw, uh, 45 degrees in a sawhorse, you're bridging a, a long area, but you get away with a much coarser tooth pattern. So that's where all that comes from. The actual filing angles, if you put any fleam on, so turning a saw it from a rip saw to a crosscut saw, you anything from you know 20 down to 10 degrees on the tooth being filed to form a point is where you get your flame angles from, which, like I say, turns it into a cross cut. The flame angle depends on how wide the actual blade width, so the width of steel that you're using, and how many teeth you've got. So on a, on a big saw with a lot of set, you can get away with um, a, a steeper angle, flame angle, which makes the tops of the teeth, so if you're looking down from the front of the saw, and you've got set on, the teeth appear to look like that. So you've got this V trough in the middle. The more flame you put on, the deeper this V trough gets, but the weaker the teeth get, because all, you've, you've got teeth that are angled, 
like I say, they're angled cutting edge here. And also, the, the you've got the point of the teeth with the fling, which makes them weak, so they become blunter faster. So there's a, there's a limit on how sharp you can have the tips of the teeth on a saw before it becomes too weak. And also, if the saw is on a thin plate with lots of the teeth together, the flea man angle will file the front edge of the last tooth off that you've been filing. So, the, so to answer your question with the tooth pan, it's, 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 we, we're doing exactly the same as what they did in the 18th century. And every saw maker ever since has done the same. It's just that we have the ability because we hand cut each tooth one by one and the filed one by one is I can adjust the um, cutter to rotate to any angle that I want. I can do any teeth PI that I want. So if someone wants a 13 and 3 quarters London long stroke and they said that's, that's the saw, I've tried it, it cuts a dream, it does everything but I can only afford one of your saws and I'll cherish it and use it for everything. Then I'll say, well, rather than go for that tooth pan, why don't you go for this in-between one, which will allow you to do dovetails, tenons. So it's not designated to a, a larger, you know, it's on a larger frame saw, but it'll let you do finer work and it'll still have a depth of plate that'll let you cut deep joints. Um, so the handle, the Chippendale saw handle, uh, any saw that we make, you can have that handle made to fit you. So we don't just say that's the design of the handle and that's it. You know, if it fits your hand, bonus. If it don't, bad luck. We don't do any of that. It's the fact of what I'll do is I'll, I'll make that handle bigger to fit that person's hand, keeping exactly the same appearance of the handle. So the handle effectively grows and shrinks keeping this, all the same geometry remains exactly the same but the handle will uh, you know I'll, I'll either you know gear it up or shrink it down and also that affects how wide the timber is so the the width of the material i'm using to cut the timber i don't just plane a board and cut all handles out of it each handle's cut individually and i hand plane it to the width that's wow. gonna match the person that's buying the saw of the size so each block handle that I make is custom to that person they're not they're not all identically and just then cut out different sizes they're actually playing down different thicknesses as well so to answer your question you, you're buying exactly the same tool but you, you're buying it with the handle proportionately the right size to fit your mostly hands. Mostly I was wondering, mostly I was wondering if the angle of the handle would change depending if somebody's short or tall, but I guess no, your the, bench, it's the relationship to your bench to you. And no, the, we, we, make, we make a variety of different saws with different high angles depending on what you're doing and that's why we make such a big range of saws. So if you look at our London long stroke range, you know, we, we make saws specifically for if you're working parallel at the bench. We also make saws um, like this one. So this one compared to this one. So you can see, I uh, don't know if I can give you the alignment of that. You can see how that one's kicked up higher if I line the back so and this is geared up for people that are cutting, you know, lap dovetails, mitre dovetails at the bench. So the saw naturally sits higher when you, you know, when you're sawing up, as opposed to having to kneel down with this saw to saw up. Wow. Um, so we, we accommodate that as well, different hang angles. But we try and have saw designs that accommodate all of those different requirements. Mm -hmm. Now the Chippendale saw, the, the handle is very unique in the fact that you can see it's got this very very high top hole so when you when you actually put the saw in your hand it fits lovely and you can see the rear horn fitting back here you can see there's a very slight gap at the top now what it enables you to do with this style 
is you can then actually pick it up and rotate it so that's at the top and it you can cut up at 45 degrees i've not done anything other than copper that handle design when i looked at it initially i did think that from how small this is to how wide the horns are apart didn't look proportionally right but having made it and tried it it is for that it's so people could use that same saw for cutting drawbacks and draw points brilliant is that okay great um, so ne next question is andy tuckwell if you want to unmute yourself and uh, come on Thanks. Um, yeah, not so much a question, I'm afraid. I'll, I'll slip in uh, something slightly different. It's more of a comment. Um, I was lucky enough to buy this. Was this your number 10 oh, dovetail saw? We're, we're about to say a wedding. Sorry, we, we just need find to it. find where you are. Um, it's, uh, you donated it to uh, Richard's auction, I think must be three years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was the, uh, the lucky winner. I just wanted to say it is superb. I love it. It's the best saw I've ever had, best tool I've got. If anybody else is thinking of buying a skeleton saw, do. If you can get one, do, because you'll love it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> good, good, Thank good, you. Good, good, good bit of marketing there, isn't it? Um, right, J Jim, Jim Hendricks. Oh. Oh, hello, it's me. I'm here. Hello. <laughs> can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see you now. You can hear me good. We're, we're, we're on a little iPad, so we're trying to flick through to find where people are. Uh, Shane, if yeah, you want, what, what you can do is um, go to gallery view at this time, and then you can see that everybody through, or, or you can go to speaker view. Speaker view, then whoever's talking, it comes up on your screen that's big. Oh, yeah. Nice speaker view. It might be more. Yeah, top top yeah, right, top right. I'll swing, swing your finger oh, across. If it's the we'll, 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 we'll wing it. Are you on a tablet then? Yeah. Yeah, just uh, scan, it, scan it to the, scan it towards your right. Flick your finger across towards I the right. I can see you. We can see we you We can now. see you. We're, we're on you. Okay. All right. First You're of all, all um, I'm going to, I'm going to join with, with um, Richard and Bill um, in, in the, in the draw that we had just to say thank you personally, because last week it was all a rush and it was all about Bill. I remember that. Um, but uh, this week is all about you. So just a personal thanks. You got me out of the biggest load of dogs to do do I have ever had ever. And I'm putting it in the box tonight and I'm looking at it thinking that was perfect. So thank you very much oh. for doing that for the, for the draw. Um, my question, um, because um, I've never used a large, as you know, I make small tools normally and the, and the staircase saw was quite a large acreage for me. Um, and I, deliberately wanted to use um, uh, peacock oil on it um, and it, you know it is it is wonderful I have a question because I, I read through the, the, the gum about how to apply it but when you're applying it to let's say beach um, I put a, a, a base coat down and it just goes and sucks the whole lot in and disappears in in seconds um, what are the subsequent coats I mean what what do you what do you do and how do you finish when you, it's like, uh, I found it like um, BLO in as much as it, you get to a point where it won't take any more. And then what do you do? That's my, that's my question. Yeah, well, the, the way it works is, it, it's got loads of different oils in it. It's got tree sap resins in it. It's got nothing that's, you know, artificial in it. So it's quite an old style finish of finishes that have been used you know, since the pyramids went up, they were using these sort of finishes, you know, on wood. Um, so when you build the finish up, your first coat, like you said, you want to keep the wood wet. So you're just feeding it, you're filling all the pores of the wood, you're sealing it up like you would seal, you know, like, you know, oiling a cricket bat to make it, you know, spring and not and not crack. So you, so that, that stage is strengthening the wood. Now, then you've got the option of when it starts to build up and it won't take any more. So this is the oil's dried off. You put another coat on the following day. The day after that, you put another coat on. After three coats of oiling, the wood really won't want to take any more. You'll see patches where 
it will shine after an hour and patches where it will sink in. Once it stops sinking in, you're actually building the oil up to the surface of the wood. And you're not, you're not treating it like a varnish or a finishing oil where you're, you're building it above the wood. You, you can increase the luster. Now, you've, you can do that in either two ways. You can either friction rub it with your hands, so you put the oil on, leave it for an hour to, to tack off, take it off with a cloth, leave it for another 15 minutes, and then you can just give it a light rub with your hands, which will remove any smears that you've got from a cloth. You'll take any excess off, and you, you actually, the oil's just thickened up in the fact that it's, it, it's not going to go sticky, but you, you're actually rubbing it in and, and filling the pores of the wood if you want a flatter finish. The other thing you can do at that stage is you can wet sand, so you're producing a slurry with the oil and the wood fibre. So if you use, you know, 600 grit wet and dry, you can actually gently sand in the grain direction with the oil. And what it'll do is it'll, it'll create a, a slurry of wooden oil, which will fill up, you know, the, the grain pockets if you want a flat finish. Some people want that flat glass looking finish like you get on an English shotgun where you're not taking the finish above the wood you've sealed the grain, you've got a mirror finish on the wood. And some people just like that oiled up and look to the wood. Um, when we finish the handles, some people want it deep, they'll specify or want it to look, you know, like a mirror. And some people just like that natural look. And the thing with the oil is, even in another two or three years, you can put a coat of oil on and, the, and it'll take it. It won't just sit on the top, it'll actually take it back into the wood. So you, you can always re-oil. The other thing is if you any damage anywhere over time, you can give it a light sand, there's enough wood in the oil just above the wood and it'll still look fine. Or you can apply the oil so you're not trying to match in finishes. And this is why a lot of cabinet makers are using it now. Um, we do two different ones which you probably need to try, which is the um, you know we do a peacock oil wick. Um, which is, I think the one that you're using is still the, um, oh, okay. the, 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 I think the one that you're using has probably still got turpentine in it. We changed mm. the turpentine out and put a natural um, carrier in for the oil, um, which is, you know, basically non-flammable. So it just makes it even, you know, nicer to use. Good. Yeah, I'll have to get some of that then, I think. I'll have to remind me when I phone Jack about the artisan. <laughs> Number six, please. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so ne next question is going across to, to Jack. <laughs> you all right, guys? Hi. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Um, right, it's just a more well, base question, I suppose. Obviously, looking at the saws that you've made today, obviously a Cupid one, how do you go from making your first saw to something you're comfortable selling and then obviously to your level now? So what, what's that journey look like? Because obviously to me, it's like, you know, you make these perfect saws. You obviously were just born that way. Like. <laughs> I, th I think um, the thing is, uh, well, Shane um, works in 3D in your head, don't you? Yeah. So he, he sees everything in his head before he actually makes it. So it's actually perfect before he even makes it so when he commits to actually doing it in person the first saw is actually perfect yeah. so um so that. We, we we don't have any prototypes here everything that's made first is actually sold so that this saw here which yeah. is you know which is the first first one you can see on this side on the blade that is you can just see there it's stamp number one so that is that's the first saw off paper. And that'll be sold, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, So it, it, it's the way I've always worked. I'll, I'll try and, when I'm drawing something out, I'll try and, I, I imagine myself making it. Mm. So mm. in my head, when I come to make a tool, you know, if it's a new style or a new pattern or, you know, something that I'm doing different, I've already mentally made it and then when i come to make it it, it feels like i i am really learning anything new i'm just doing it because i've i feel like i've already done it 
and it's just the way that I've I've always worked. I think you're just gifted, aren't you? <laughs> just, um, yeah. So so when I made you know when when I used to restore furniture, it was very much the same thing as as looking around it, looking at all the problems, you know, studying it, marking everything up, and then I'd just knock it apart and then you know do what needed doing. Um, which was a different way to what other people do that were yeah. you know almost scared to do. I think also the, the major thing is being able to consistently do something to such an exceptional quality as well over and over again by hand is quite a skill really isn't it? Yeah it's quite hard to do. To, to put across to people I make every saw like it's my own. I, I am in the headset of, of thinking well I'd be right you know, I'd never have that attitude. If I'm not happy with anything at any stage, that's it. It, it doesn't go out of the door. So it's you, you've got to have that pride of always thinking you're making it for yourself rather than it's just a job and you're banging it out for someone else. And this is why, you it know, takes so <laughs> it, it takes so long to make. Yeah. And, you know, the hours that go into it, actually, the people look at the cost of our source and think, Gosh, they're expensive, but the hourly rate of making those saws, I can earn more in McDonald's, you know, handing yeah. out burgers. It, it, it's it's actually true, you know. We've yeah. we've been doing this. We're going into our seventh year now. Um, obviously, we're an endangered craft. We're on the critically endangered list, and um, you know, we're, <laughs> we're we're only taking we're still only taking one wage every month, you know. So it's we're definitely not doing it for profit. It's more. Um, because we were passionate about what we're doing and we're passionate about the craft. Oh yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so visualise it then is what I'm getting from that. <laughs> gosh, gosh. I'm right, next question over to Louis. Hi uh, guys, hi uh, Shane and Jack. Um, I'm hi. just sat here, I'm sat here in just total awe, in awe uh, of your craftsmanship and the way you're able to conceptualise everything and, and put it together. So. You speak um, about, you know, um, gun stocks and things like that. So I'm, I'm really fascinated to, to understand how you got, you know, how you started out, like let's say from your teenage years all the way to where you are now. You know, how did it morph into what you're doing? Um, and when did you kind of, you know, was it the research you were into first? I mean, like a lot of us, I mean, like a lot of woodworkers and people who are into crafts, we, we, we love doing things. We have lots of hobbies and, you know, and, and we love you know getting obsessed and looking at things and understanding it and for you how did that journey kind of uh, take off and, and you know when did you kind of sit back and realize well, well hey I've, I've got something here that I think other people would, would like gosh we get asked this question so many times <laughs> yeah, no, it's, good. Um, it's a good one um, I think it's one that Bill's probably uh, asking as well but it, if, if I go with my history of you know when I was younger I used to you know, make model planes and, and things like that. I used to get bits of wood bought for me and, and make things. Um, so uh, I was brought up around repairing things, repairing cars and things like that. So practical side of using tools is just something that I've always done, you know, from being able to walk. Um, at school, I worked for a blacksmith part-time. So I did a lot of, you know, you know forgery work you know making all sorts of things repairing things wow. um, making gates you know raw iron work um, from that when I left school I went to then work for a gunsmith so I trained as a gunsmith you know doing um, you know I, I, I was shown by you know he, he was very old and retired he had a gun shop he'd been a Birmingham gun maker um, and he, he, you know, he, he won over my shoulder, you know, I'd, I'd do a lot of work myself and then I'd go, you know, what, what's the best way of doing this, you know, whether it's checkering or different things and he just, you know, with a, you know, with a cigarette in, his, in one hand and, and wood shavings everywhere, you know, show you what to do and I, that, that's how I, you know, that's how I learned. So restocking, making springs, um, all of that sort of work. Now, what happened at that point was um, we, we decided to make high precision target pistols, um, which are now banned in England. Um, so I got into the into looking at you know different you know different types of guns of how to make them more accurate. 
how to you know get all the movement out how to make them you know shoot through the same hole at 50 meters so that precision of making something better i think probably stems from then as how to get the performance out of something um moving on from that I, I, you know that that closed down I, I went into engineering manufacturing um making components um i've had jobs making you know prototype like aircraft um I, i've done all sorts of array of things but they've always involved my hands um you know right down to you know the the last job before i, I do what i'm doing now um was in you know development making you know things that you know creating new ideas um so the the, the the jobs that really stand out for me are you know probably the the blacksmithing the gunsmithing and then i worked for a, a cabinet maker and furniture restorer and i specialize in georgian furniture where i'd make you know repair the furniture do inlays you know make a drawer if a drawer was missing make it all to match kept an old timber selection so all of those jobs couldn't be done on a machine they had to be done by hand and that's where using hand tools became more you know you can't get it on the machine you've got to be able to work on it where it is and i couldn't find you know i used to use a lot of saws and i had a lot of good saws and i used to sharpen my own saws and no one else there knew how to sharpen the saws which i couldn't understand um but the um the uh they, they would never cut how i wanted them to cut and i think that and then going into a job which i didn't really you know it was, it was well paid it was a good job but I, I i ended up pushing paper and you know managing people which isn't really what i'm about so the this the the, the saws was something that came from really that precision hand making something a saw is very much like a pistol in the fact that you know the way it fits and feels how it fits in the hand how everything should line up not having to fight it so all of that all interlinks in with what we're doing so it's just a you know it's like a marriage of all different you know metal work woodwork bringing different materials together thinking of you know ideas to improve things to make things more precision than something manufactured and i think that's really where the saws are now now, you know, I made a, a saw originally and Jack looked at that saw and said, you know, we could, you know, we could sell these, you know, the, and, and that's really where it came from. Um, the first, the very first saw that I made, um, I sent to David Charlesworth, which I think most people know who he is. You know, he's a, uh, you know, he's a, a, a furniture maker and teacher, you know, he's, he, he holds private classes he does lots of things so we, and we sent him a saw thinking well you know if, if he likes it and it works if it's good enough for him you know we're on the right path and we sent him the saw he uses the saw still now and he said you know this is brilliant I, you know he had it under a microscope looking at the teeth and he said i've got everyone's saw that everyone sends me you know trying to get advertisement through him and he says it's the most accurate tooth pattern i've ever seen how do you do it and i says well just by hand and he, he couldn't believe that they were done by hand and not by machine. So we knew we were on the right path then. And it's just grown from then uh, of, you know, researching different saws, different makers, being able to hold, you know, people will, you know, I've had saws on loan, um, which I've looked at and copied, you know, and, and it, one thing leads into something else into something else so you 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 you're always learning um you know you you, you can never say oh i'm the expert at, at this you're always learning all the time so you know our source will continue to you know develop but they will always develop with a look from that era every saw that you you look at from ours you, you instantly think oh that looks you know it looks from that period it do, we don't want things to look you know real fancy and futuristic because at the end of the day the the we we're not necessarily changing everything in the geometry of the saw we've just taken it from the best period 
Yeah, so it looks 18th century, but inside it's very 21st century, basically. So, yeah. Brilliant. Louis, I hope, I hope that answered your question. Oh, it certainly did. Thank you. I'm going to be watching this, this back again just to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So ne next question, I mean, we, we normally limit the questions to half an hour, but this, no, is, it's fine. Too, this, this is too good to, to stop. So uh, next question is from Matthew. <laughs> is that Matthew Platt? I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Matthew, if you un unmute yourself, Matthew. I think it's Matthew Platt. Isn't it? yeah, I think it's... There we go. Hello. Um, all right. First of all, congratulations on a fantastic presentation. That was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, <laughs> So hats off to you. Um, also, congratulations on re-energizing a 150, 200 year old business model and making such a success of it. It's, it's fabulous to see. And you are taking something from a period when it was as close to perfect as possible and then advancing that, which is, absolutely brilliant to see it's very rare and it's very special and it's very much appreciated oh, thank you um, a quick question um first of all that archer saw is absolutely gorgeous that's definitely on the shopping list if i may um also i wanted to ask you about the wick version of the oils which as usual um i've i've I was amazed at peacock oil, absolutely flabbergasted at how good it is. And then you went and made it better and now you've gone and made it better again. Um, yeah. Can you just run through the differences and the, the, the graduation in the improvements of that? Yeah, the, the new one isn't actually a better version. It's just a different version. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the materials that are in it are exactly the same, but at, at different ratios. So the, the, the normal peacock oil allows you to build, like I say, up to the surface um, over, you know, you know, four or five coats. The wick oil, uh, the way that works, although at first appearance when you use it, you think, oh, it's, it seems a bit more runny, you know, than the other oil. It's very, very fractionally is, but it actually builds and thickens faster. So you can actually build up over less coats of oil. So the, the first coat of oil is penetrating exactly the same depth. The original oil um, allows you to just keep building at a fine rate at a time. The wick oil just thickens up that little bit faster. So effectively you're getting the penetration but not quite as much penetration as you get with the, the standard peacock oil. So it allows, it effectively thickens up over half an hour and it allows you to rub it in to get a flatter finish. And that flat finish lets you build just above the wood. The standard peacock oil lets you build up level with the wooden fill. This allows you just to put, if you want that extra shine on top, you can, you can just, you know, you, you, you're not putting a, what looks like a lacquered finish but the, the finish effectively lets it be thicker. The other thing is is it's just that little bit harder um, allowing you to grow that tiny little skin on the top. Um, as far as using it and compatibility goes exactly the same. You can you can, you can pour you know half of one and half of the other and make your own concoctions up. Um, we, the 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 idea behind it is just for people that have said, I love the peacock oil, but can I have a faster finish that I can do in two days as opposed to a week? So some people like the, you know, the, the traditional one, the, the, like I said, the, the makeup's the same, but it, it's just in different ratios. You know, there's over 12 different ingredients that go into the peacock oil. It's not me just decanting something out and, banging it in a bottle and putting a label on, there's, there's a lot that goes into it and each thing has its own benefit. But just by, you know, fiddling about, you know, Jack will tell you when you're coming to the workshop, you know, it's full of bottles, <laughs> bottles of everywhere. samples of all different things that I've tried. And I'm always, you know, experimenting with different things. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's, I, I have one on the go now that, um, 
you know, it, 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 it can be put in, in anything, but it, it allows you to do, you know, to get a, you know, another, another type of finish, but that's something for the future. But, but the, there's, the, they're all compatible and some people will use the traditional peacock oil first and then just give it a, a, a coat of wick over the top. Um, like I said, the, the one just goes off that bit faster. The, the only difference that you'll mainly find is um, it, it is just the speed, and that's why we called it wick. You know, wick as in yeah, fast. It's a um, uh, wick is a bit of a Yorkshire thing for quick. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you for that. Um, ne next question, Derek. Derek Jones, Low Fat Robo. Good evening, you two. How are you doing? Hiya, hiya, Derek. How are you? You okay? Yeah, we're great. Thank you. Fine. Now. Do you remember, and it must have been five, maybe six years ago, um, I, you, I think you made your, your sort of writing debut in a certain magazine, and I asked you to write me an article, of all things, about checkering. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. It, it was one of my favourite... It favorite was really articles. hard. <laughs> it's really hard. It was one of my favourite articles that I, I commissioned all, all my time at 10 years at a magazine. Oh. And I don't think anyone's ever written anything like it ever since about that subject, certainly not in woodworking magazines. I think I've seen you do checkering on a saw handle, a yeah. bespoke handle for somebody in the past. Yeah. 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 Um, Have you got any, any, any plans to make that a regular feature or is no, it just something that you, you could request? No, it's something that you can request. So if you want gun stock checkering on a saw handle, it has mm. to be, there has to be enough so if I, if, I, if I show you this one, yep. you can see where there's the radius and then you've got the flats. Mm -hmm. There's just enough here to put a checkering handle, you know, to, mm -hmm. to actually put a checkering detail on. Whereas if you take a saw uh, like this Chippendale saw, you can see it's got a very slim handle. It's very you know radius so you end up with such a, a slim piece it mm. wouldn't be worth putting it on because there won't be enough there so right. i've um just hang on so just to give you an idea okay i'll just get this the right way around so you would end up with a pattern there. I mean, obviously, this is this is actually is that way. Is that? I have that, that many. I'm trying to do it in reverse on the on the camera, but you can see it sort of looks like that. I can see it. Yeah, yeah. And then that's checkered, Fantastic. and it, it does it does look. Um, it looks, it really looks good. good. Yeah. It's quite hard to checkering. Checkering within a, a small column is quite hard to do. When you've got open sides, it's easy. You're using a, a tool which is very, uh, sure, yeah. So that's, uh, that's the tip of a checkering tool. We can see how small it is. And the handle it goes on. So I'm pushing that in uh, within that small border and making a cut, and I can't overshoot, and I've got to start it in the right place. So it's quite it's quite a hard process to do. Modern checkering is done by laser, um, but to do it by hand, there are actually many people that can do it now. It's a bit of a dying a dying trade, really. It's only really the London gun makers that yeah. still do it. Well, when I when I order my my first saw from you, I'll, I'll be asking for for checkering. That's for sure. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> the, the only time I've seen the other saws, I've seen it on uh, I think our sort of surgeon saws. Yeah, surgeon saws. They used to have it on with the ebony handles. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the it, it it does add a, a it it's in always done for the grip. Although it does provide a grip, it was put on shotguns originally. Um, for when people were shooting out in the rain, so the, the gun wasn't slippy. Um, but it's become a decorative feature. You know, it goes on areas where you're not even 
having your hand there. It's just a lot of it's aesthetics now. Wonderful, wonderful. We've got one more question from Martin. Martin. Is Martin still here? Does... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, Martin. Okay, fantastic. Hi, Shane. Uh, Hi. Hi. I love that. That was so great. Um, I make I make I make hand planes uh, for fun, and um, and I try to make sure absolutely certain they're quarter sawn, and and it's quite difficult to find quarter sawn timber, so I end up buying lumps of timber that I have to resaw. Um, a few weekends ago, I changed I changed the pattern of my one of my uh, so a 10 pound distant actually as it turned out from cost cut to to rip saw um but in in the meantime i ordered a, a japanese uh rip saw which is which is this one and and as it as it turns out i might well be retiring my western saw for this because it it, it just uh it, it proved so fantastic in 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 soaring dimensionally and I know it's a bit maybe controversial on the subject we're talking, but it was I, I don't know just uh, just experiment with your thoughts on 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 Japanese saws and things. Yeah, I you know I've got loads. I've got Western saws all around this workshop that you can't see, but trust me, they're there. Yeah, uh, you know, but I, I, I was so gobsmacked by by this saw cutting to the line and and um, without any without any pressure or anything it just got it just yeah got it, no no that, that's fine i mean i i have japanese sauce you know <laughs> i i use japanese sauce every saw has its purpose yeah. the, the, the the main point that you found is if you'd have bought that panel saw whichever saw you were using new when it was made it mm. would cut equally as well as that new japanese saw so it's so, probably my so, filing that turned so, it into in yeah if you if you try and compare blunt equipment it's like it's like saying i've got a i've got a b and q you know cheap stanley plane and i've got a norris plane if that norris plane is blunt and that cheap stanley plane is sharp that yeah. plane will cut better in the norris yeah, yeah so it's the same it's the same thing you mm. you can't compare something that's sharp brand new out of the box so the the, the difference is for japanese saws the two configurations are different they don't use 60 degree angles they, no, they no, use no. feather files for filing yeah. they're done by machine the tips are heat treated you can't resharpen them unless you use a diamond file um they have the uses you know for, for fine work they're, they're very good um you know and and a lot of people use them on bigger stuff but the the the, the downside of them is one you're cutting on the pull stroke which i particularly don't really like you know i can make saws that cut on the pull stroke you have far more accuracy on pushing a saw forward into your line than drawing it back from the other side of the line in my opinion mm. um that that goes with anything um the other thing is is you've got a rigid blade so when the blade's fixed and it's tensioned it will cut much sweeter than the blade that's flapping about now japanese saws also make saws with back saw but the back it does not provide anything than stopping the blade flapping it doesn't provide any tension so that they, they cut differently um and you know that they're equally as good i can't say oh no. japanese saws are rubbish because they are you know because they, they are good but every saw has the use on depending I th on I, th I think it. it i think it depends it depends on your on the user experience i mean i yeah, my, yeah, exactly. you know, my, I mean, my, my dad was my dad was a carpenter and 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 he you know he hated he hated uh, you know, buying a, a, a hard tooth point saw from B and Q or whatever, like most most people do. You know, he left me a, a, a saw that was that was that thick that he'd used all his life and it was sharpened to within a, you know, an inch of his death. But he always used to say to me, he said, "You can't steer them. 
you can't steer them to the line, which is what you what you do with uh, with a Western style saw, isn't it? You know, you, you steer them to the line because you because you, you can. Uh, you know. Yeah, but, and, yeah, but just to get away from that, if if a saw is is correctly made, there is no steering involved on the back saw. So the saws that we make have a so if you've got a plate thickness of only 15 foul, we put enough set on that on that plate to allow the plate to actually pass down the line of what it's cutting. So the plate is made perfectly square. There's no there's no distortion in the plate. Each tooth's aligned absolutely perfectly. So the actual saw plate on a proper Georgian saw, the saw plate itself is effectively the fence. So once you start one of our saws down this line, all you do is look at where you want to stop it. You I, don't I, think, oh, I need to do no, this. No, 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 no. What, 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 from, yeah. his, from my father's point of view, he was a site carpenter, so he didn't. He, we're not talking about back saws, but you know, he yeah, he, he, you would, he would be able to steer a saw. Yeah, oh yeah, on a panel a western saw, saw yeah. if he needed yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, so not not yeah. I understand in a workshop environment, it's you know, you 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 start the cut, bang, it's 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 on target. Yeah. You finish it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we make panel saws taper ground for that reason, so that yeah. you as you're pushing the saw forward from the nose. You've you've got a much thinner amount of material at the top to elect, to effectively let you steer the saw, yeah. um, so and which would taper ground. Um, right. But yeah, yeah. Pretty so he, good. Yeah. Uh, m m moving on, one one more question then from from Abby. Abby's got a question to ask us all. Hello, guys. Um, Hi. Abdella um, from Nafisi Studio. Uh, my yeah. wife and I also we run a. Um, furniture making business together um, it was a fabulous 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 talk and very inspiring to listening to you and very glad to be alive in the time that you guys are making swords so we can hopefully um, gather together and just uh, purchase our new swords I have so many questions to ask from you um, so I try to just narrow them down to to few and hopefully I can ask the rest of my questions when I'm making my purchase, hopefully. <coughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, I, I, I just followed you on Instagram. I, yeah. I'm sorry I didn't know you guys exist. Um, it's just, it's just fun. It's just uh, unbelievable. Um, so how do you choose um, the, in terms of the grain of the wood? How do you pick up for the handle of the wood? How do you pick up? The, the choice of your wood. How, how do you how do you make that, make that decision? Because obviously there are there going to be pulling and pushing, and the and the pressure is going to go on the top of that grain. How do you? How, um, what was that choice um, that you make? My second question is um, for for me when I purchased your saw, and um, I have a small project which I will tell you about. It's going to be an English um, uh, tool cabinet. And that I'm going to be making, uh, hopefully, will be a story around it. Um, what would be your suggestion in terms of um, placing the saw for, for the long term? Say this cabinet is going to last for hundreds of years, hopefully. Um, what would your suggestion be in terms of how this saw should be placed and, um, and maintained? And during my lifetime, how, what's the suggestion from you would be for me to look after this saw in terms of oiling it? Yes, yeah. talk about handle, but I have personally problem with my uh, very very quality saws that um, they start. Um, I mean, Derek Jones taught me how to oil this surface. But what would your suggestion be in terms of uh, maintaining? Yeah. Well, as far as timber selection goes, um, you 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 can't quite see with with where I've got. I, I could move the camera, I suppose, but we, we have a vast array of timber which we select, you know, either personally or through timber merchants that know our requirements. So timbers that we use are timbers that I, you know, say are fit to put on saws. There are so many timbers out there that aren't fit to put on saws. So, you know, the, the, 
what I said earlier was we try and use cortisone as much as possible. Um, one, that's over strength. It also gives a pretty appearance to the wood. A lot of woods look better cortisone, but it's mainly down to the shrinkage. So as that's, if, if this handle expands and contracts, it's going to do it this way. So the grain's going in this direction. So through that weakest point there, the grain is going like this. So the grain isn't like that, effectively, where it could snap. It's, it's passing through in this direction. So quarter saw means that the expansion is, is not really going to affect anything. If it was rift saw, or if it was you know, a slab cut, then you've got the risk of this handle wanting to curve this way. So rather than it just swing, shrink parallel, it, it wants to effectively do that. If it was if it was cut on the on the crown, so it's all down to movement and movement that's going to happen in the future. Now some woods don't move once they're dry and they're cut. So you know, like Bill's favourite wood of boxwood. Once boxwood's moved and it's settled, it ain't going to move again. Ebony is pretty much the same. That doesn't really want to move again. Ironwood don't want to move again. Once it's well, and and that's one of the reasons why we use the peacock oil. See it goes into the pores and it stops that loss and absorption of moisture. It effectively seals the wood rather than just putting a skin on top of the wood, um, which doesn't do that. So we keep a lot of timbers in different grades, um, you know, depending how pretty someone wants it. We, we have an array of all sorts, both English, you know, English timbers. We have a lot of, um, you know, exotic timbers as well, you know, which, you know, are suitable for making on source. Now, some timbers contain oils that will actually rust carbon steel. So, um, you know, things like olive wood, you know, if that comes into contact with carbon steel, it'll just rust it. So, so on a, on a conventional design, you couldn't use it. But if you've got a design like that where the wood doesn't come into contact with the blade, then that opens you up again to different woods that you can use. Um, as far as storing the saw, in a saw, you know, if you're making a, a tool chest to put the saw in, don't copy what Benjamin Seaton did with putting, uh, he put, if you can see that, that's his tool chest and you can see the saws in there. When those saws come out, they all brush over the top of it each other and these saws uh, thanks to Richard Arnold um, you know taking photographs of these these tools shows evidence of cuts in the horns of where these saws are drawn out so the best way of storing them would be lower down actually vertical um, so effectively stacked side by side if you add saws um, which allows them to breathe they're not pushed against anything. One mistake people make is to use, you know, a saw cover where they'll have three or four saws in a in one wallet with a strap round. Now you've got the width of all the handles together and the blades which are thinner with a strap. That uh, that gives you the possibility of actually bending the the backs on the blades if if you know if it, it's not a good way of storing it. Also, storing carbon steel in leather is not a good idea. So a leather sheath will absorb moisture, carbon blades will rust. So that's not a good idea. As far as making the saw cut in the wood brilliantly, wax the blade, don't oil it. Put, put actual, um, the, the best wax I've found to put on the sides of blades yes. is Renaissance wax, which gives a very fine, thin layer but it does not come off the blade and it makes the, the saw glide beautiful in, the, in its curve and it doesn't leave any residue on the wood. And it, so that, that, that's what I would suggest you put on the sides of the blade. Um, beeswax and things like that, rubbing a candle, it, it, it just rubs off. And also it, it'll put that on the wood that you're cutting, which you don't want in a glue joint. So, um, so a, a very fine hard wax like Renaissance wax is what I recommend. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm muted. I'm unmuted now. Bill, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, come on, Bill. Come on, Bill. He, well, he, he was telling me he's got this great question he wants to ask you. And he, but he's not yeah, but this. somebody, somebody, are we on? Yeah. Somebody's more or less covered it. I wanted uh, Shane That's to talk that. about his previous work before he started saw making. He told me a lot more than he's told tonight. <laughs> but that's, that's, that was my question. <laughs> well, um, Shane and Jack, I mean, that, that was absolutely phenomenal. Um, you've got 25 people still after almost two hours, absolutely wow. captivated um, with, with, you know, with, with, with your passion and enthusiasm. For the, for the craft of making English hand saws. It, it really is uh, amazing. Um, no, normally at this point we say, um, you know, toast, toast to the bench, um, but kind of like it's rather empty after two hours. <laughs> anyway, toast to the bench. And Shane and Jack, I, I, I do wish you all the best in, in, oh, in your you. business ventures. Um, and, and one day, hopefully, we can all own, own something similar to, you know, to what you're making, or even one of your saws would be wonderful. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank, All right. you. Thank you. Bye. So, well. Uh,